Good evening. I'm Lisa Kretz. I direct the ethics program here at the University of Evansville. And on behalf of the philosophy and religion department, I'd like to extend our thanks for your presence here this evening. So this is, you don't already know, um, the William R. Connolly Ethics Lecture Series. So it was renamed this in 2015 because of our wonderful colleague, Dr. Connolly, who's in the room. And both Dr. Connolly and his partner, Meg, are really, to my mind, some of the most active people with regard to social justice issues in Evansville. Um, so if you can share, with, or join me in a round of applause thanking them for their <laughs> This evening would not be happening without their uh, very generous support. Next, it's my honor and privilege to introduce Ricky Parker. We're especially excited to have Ricky here tonight because she's an alum from the University of Evansville. She earned her BS in Cognitive Science from the University of Evansville, her JD from Louisiana State University, where she served as president of the Trial Advocacy Board, and after graduation, Ricky practiced in the areas of employment discrimination and environmental law. In 2016, she joined the South Carolina Coastal Conservation League, an environmental advocacy nonprofit where she works to protect local farms, prevent pollution from reaching South Carolina's pristine waterways, and to ensure all citizens have a say in how their communities look and feel. Tonight, Ricky will tell the story of her road to environmental advocacy, making stops in the world of toxic tort litigation and political campaigns and yoga. <laughs> So welcome, Good evening, everyone. Thank you all so much for having me here. It's a real pleasure to be on campus um, and back at my old stomping grounds here at UE. Um, the campus has changed a little bit since I was here a decade ago, which is kind of scary that it's been that long. Um, but it's changing in some really exciting ways. And one thing I'm particularly excited to learn more about and um, to see happening is this ethics and social change degree program. Because as I look back on my career after graduating from the University of Evansville, it is clear that I was being drawn towards advocacy and towards um, community organizing. But I didn't graduate here necessarily with the skills to be really good at that work. And I spent kind of the next five years figuring it out. Um, and so I want to tell you a little bit about my journey to environmental advocacy. And then I want to highlight two of my absolute favorite projects that I get to work on on a daily basis and that are really, really close to my heart. Um, the Coastal Conservation League is an environmental advocacy nonprofit. We work in four main program areas. Um, they are land, water, and wildlife, which is really your bread and butter environmental issues. Think about making sure we all have clean water to drink, fresh air to breathe. Um, and I'm going to highlight, my final um, project that I want to highlight is our work to combat plastic pollution. And that really focuses in that program area. I also want to talk about um, a, program, a, a project that fits within our communities and transportation work, which is our opposition to uh, a roadway widening project on Hilton Head that would run right through a multi-generational Gullah community. We also have an energy and climate program we work, where we work to promote sustainable energy policies, and we have a food and ag program where we work to connect local farmers with markets for their produce, and that means grocery stores like Harris Teeter and Kroger and Whole Foods, but also high-end restaurants in the Charleston area. But before I get to all of that, I want to talk a little bit about how I got there. And uh, after I graduated from the University of Evansville, I was really a little bit rudderless. My last year here at UE, I did an uh, undergrad research fellowship at IU, and I really enjoyed being there. I enjoyed taking classes there, but unfortunately, I hated being in the lab. I needed more like what I would call natural social engagement. <laughs> like People didn't have to come to me. I wanted to be out in the community. And so I just didn't know what I was going to do because I was going to go get my PhD, but now I'm lost. So what did, what's the old joke? What do you do if you graduate undergrad and you don't know what you're going to do? Go to law school, right? Okay. 
So that's what I did. I applied to a lot of different law schools all over the country. I really wanted a change of scenery. Um, and I took a campus visit to LSU Law School in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and I fell in love with the culture, with the people, and with the natural environment in southeast Louisiana. From, you know, cypress forests to the bayous and the wildlife that call Louisiana home, I was just totally taken with it all. And I really loved my three years at um, LSU Law School, and I decided to stick around after I graduated. And I got a job with a sole practitioner who focused mostly on employment discrimination, but she had stumbled into this really big toxic tort litigation case. We had um, some clients that were victims of some of the most horrific acts of racial discrimination that you can possibly imagine at the hands of this chemical company um, that operates along the Mississippi River. But in talking to our clients, we realized that they actually were also being harmed by sulfuric acid emissions at the plant. Um, this plant manufactures sulfuric acid, but it was escaping from the vessels that they used, and the company wasn't doing an adequate job of containing it. In fact, what they were trying to do is use a system of hoses that they purchased at Lowe's to suck up this sulfuric acid mist. And it was getting in their employees' eyes, it was burning their skin when it leaked through the pipes, um, but unfortunately, Louisiana is a place that is very industry friendly. And when we took this case all the way to a two week long jury trial, the jury actually found in favor of DuPont. And we, when we pulled the jurors afterwards, they said that they believed the story that our clients were, were telling them and um, the videos that they were seeing. But unfortunately, they just didn't feel like they could um, render a, a verdict against um, a major job producer in the state. And I was incredibly discouraged by this. And I didn't really know what I wanted to do about it, but I knew that I wasn't making the difference in the legal field that I thought I would be. Now that doesn't mean that lawyers don't do great things for the environment, they do. There are um, you know, examples of legal cases that have truly made a difference in people's lives. And um, I, I don't wanna say anything to, to besmirch that work, but I realized that it wasn't for me. I was also just kind of physically burnt out from that, the process of that trial. Um, we were working until 4 in the morning and showing up at court at 8 a.m., and it just wasn't sustainable. And so I thought, well, what am I going to do? But I had this amazing opportunity to serve on a campaign for a governor's race. And so this is Scott Angel. He's a Republican. Please don't hold it against him. He's a wonderful, wonderful man. Um, but he had a particular expertise in the area of um, coastal restoration. So Louisiana, you may know, is losing about a, a football field worth of land every hour. And this is due to the impact of the oil and gas industry on the coastline. Um, they've dug canals throughout the, um, throughout the marsh system and that causes land subsidence into the water. Um, it also is due to sea level rise and in increased storm strength and frequency. And Louisiana has this coastal restoration master plan, which is a hundred billion dollar plan to restore Louisiana's coastline. And Scott was influential in getting that master plan funded from the first day. He also um, had a huge uh, a amount of knowledge about um, wildlife and fisheries management. His dad was head of Louisiana Wildlife and Fisheries for years, and he was also the lieutenant governor during the BP oil spill. And so working for him, I really just got hooked on coastal policy. And I knew that that was kind of what I wanted to continue doing um, for the foreseeable future. But in the meantime, during law school and the years that followed, I had fallen in love with this guy. Okay, this guy's name is Jordan Parker. And aside from the obvious, which is that he's incredibly handsome, uh, <laughs> also equally obvious is that he is a captain in the United States Marine Corps. And um, in 2016, he started his training to become a judge advocate in the Marine Corps. And we moved to Quantico, Virginia for him to pursue that dream. I didn't have a job. I picked up some legal work on the side, some contract work, but mostly what I did was get my yoga teacher training certificate. <laughs> this was something that I had wanted to do for a really long time, um, and I took that six months to do it. 
I know you all didn't come here tonight on, at 7 o'clock on a Monday to hear me talk about yoga, so I won't bore you for too long. Um, but I do think that it is incredibly important in whatever career that you choose to find something that really keeps you grounded. Whatever career you, you end up in, it's going to have stress, right? You have to find those things that give you joy and keep you grounded. And for me, that's teaching yoga. I do that three days a week now. Um, I have my own yoga and meditation practice that I maintain. For you, it may be a book club. It may be swimming laps at the pool. Whatever it is, find it, stick with it. And with that, I'll get off my wellness sit box. <laughs> so after Jordan finished his training, uh, we learned that we would be headed to this place. This is Beaufort, South Carolina. It's where um, Marine Corps Recruit Depot Paris Island is located. It's where every Marine Corps recruit east of the Mississippi River gets his, his training. Um, and it's where every female recruit in the entire nation gets her training. Um, so it's an incredible place full of a lot of history, but it's really a sleepy little town. It's about 15,000 permanent residents. Um, and it gets quite a bit of tourist uh, visitation as well. Um, but there's not a lot going on. It's mostly a retirement community. And so I really thought, okay, well, what am I going to do? Am I going to, like, teach yoga and sling drinks at the bar in the evening to make a living? <laughs> like, I don't know. Um, so I started looking at places to volunteer and fill my time while I looked for a real job or set for the South Carolina bar or something like that and I stumbled upon the South Carolina Coastal Conservation League. And it is, in my mind, still truly a miracle that they had a job posting. And when I looked at it, my, my experience really fit what they were looking at, looking for to a T. So it was really um, an incredible happenstance, and um, I feel fortunate to have landed with the league. Um, but we are, as I said, an environmental advocacy nonprofit, and our broad mission is to protect Louisiana's coastal natural resources. We work from the North Carolina border down to the South, down to the Georgia border, and in that coastal region. So not in the mountains, not in the inland area, but just that coastline. We have three offices. Our main office is in Charleston. We have the satellite offices in Beaufort and in Georgetown in the northern part of the state. And we also have um, a legislative affairs office where we do work on statewide policies that affect the coast. And one town that we work in really often in the South Coast office is Hilton Head Island. Has anyone been to Hilton Head? Yes, a few of you. Does anybody know anything about Hilton Head? Okay, what, what do you think about when you think Hilton Head Island? You raised your hand. <laughs> what do you think about when you think of Hilton Head Island? Anybody? Golf. 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 That's right. Golf. Resort. Sand. That's what Hilton Head is known for. Um, but and, and truly, there are only about 30,000 permanent residents on Hilton Head Island. It's this small barrier island off um, about 30 minutes outside of Savannah. It's right on the South Carolina-Georgia border. Um, and it's about 50 square miles. And um, it gets about 2.5 million visitors every year in this tiny coastal barrier island. And there's only one way in and one way out. Up in the upper left-hand corner of your screen, you'll see that little tiny yellow line. That is US 278. And for years and years, there have been proposals to widen this roadway. It's two lanes in, two lanes out, and they want to widen it to three lanes. The town has been talking about this for several years. The county has been talking about it for several years. Um, but the conversation didn't really pick up until the South Carolina Department of Transportation recognized that one of the bridges over the marsh to Hilton Head Island was structurally deficient. It was actually listed as one of the top 25 most structurally deficient bridges in the state. And so DOT stepped in and said, hey, we really need to get this thing fixed. We're going to put it on our schedule for replacement. And the county said, well, OK, great. We want the bridge replaced. It's not safe. But you're just going to replace it and make it the exact same as it's always been. And we are recognizing that with 2.5 million tourists coming onto the island every year, we need increased capacity. We need to decrease the amount of congestion on this roadway. And what if we contribute some of that funding? 
would you allow us to have kind of a stake in how this bridge looks and feels? And DOT said yes. So in November of 2018, um, Beaufort County voted on a sales tax referendum to raise the funding to replace the bridge. And it passed overwhelmingly. Now, this has really increased the conversation around widening the roads, because how are you going to increase capacity? How are you going to decrease congestion if not widening lanes? Well, the Coastal Conservation League believes that in a phenomenon that is well established called induced demand. So more lanes alleviates traffic for about a year, but what it really does is drive development out, create urban sprawl. And within a year or two, that roadway is just as congested as, congested as it's always been. So really widening the roadway is a bad idea, just from the standpoint of alleviating congestion. It's not going to work. But also, it's over valuable salt marsh ecosystem. That environmental harm is, is significant, and so we have concerns about that. But the biggest concern that we have about this project is the impact that it will have to the Stony community. Stony is a multi-generational Gullah community. It's at the very base of this bridge, and um, it is already completely bisected by the road. But to understand how problematic that is, you need to know a little bit about Hilton Head's history. So Hilton Head was settled by European settlers in the 18th century. They brought over indentured servants to help them uh, establish their plantations, um, but quickly realized that the European indentured servants that they brought over weren't capable of working their plantations. They didn't have the knowledge necessary, and so they started to engage in the transatlantic slave trade. They brought over slaves mostly from West Africa, and the plantation system really took off on Hilton Head. We have a 50 square mile island, and by 1861, when South Carolina seceded from the Union, there were 24 plantations on the island. Now, a few months after South Carolina seceded from the Union, Union forces um, basically felled Hilton Head Island. The, um, and when Union forces landed on the island, they realized that all the plantation owners had gotten the heck out of Dodge. They had already left, and they left all these newly freed slaves, or freedmen. And the Union forces weren't exactly sure what to do with the freedmen, and so they gave them Drayton Plantation. Um, Drayton Plantation became a town known as Mitchellville, and these freedmen actually lived here and established a town that existed until the 1920s an existing Gullah community that retained the West African heritage. Um, if you know anything about, um, it, about um, you know, U.S. history, you know how unique this was to have a town of freedmen um, living independently. And after the war ended, these plantation owners were pardoned, and they came back and tried to get their land back, but the, uh, the folks who lived at Mitchellville bought it back from them and continued to live on the property. This is not an unusual tale on Hilton Head Island. Many freedmen bought the land from the original plantation owners. Some were allowed to just stay on the land because the plantation owners never came back. And um, they were really the only people that were left on the island. And until the 1950s, they lived this very rural existence. They farmed, they relied on the ocean for what they ate, and the only way you could access Hilton Head was by boat. So it remained very small, very rural, a population of about 3,000 initially, and it waned all the way down to about 300 people. And they retained this West African heritage called Gullah. I won't go into that too much because that's not my story to tell, but know that um, you know if you've ever sat around the fireplace and saying kumbaya, that's a Gullah word, it means come by here. Um, and it's got this whole set of wonderful cuisine and arts um, so I would encourage you, if you're ever in South Carolina, to, to take a look and experience it because it's a truly unique part of South Carolina's history um, and it's really wonderful to experience. But all of that rural existence changed in 1956 when the first swing bridge was installed to Hilton Head Island. That same year, 48,000 vehicles made their way onto the island. So we're starting to see this vehicular traffic move onto Hilton Head Island. This guy came. This guy's name is Charles Frazier. Um, and Charles Frazier is the de developer of Sea Pines Plantation. He purchased 5,000 
uh, acres worth of land on the southern end of Hilton Head, and he started a private residential development. It is gated. You cannot get in the gate unless you have a gate pass or you pay $3 to get in there. And many gated communities on Hilton Head, there is no price that you can buy your way in. Um, and Charles Fraser tried to do things in an environmentally friendly way. Today, we know that some of the things he did were not necessarily environmentally friendly. He dug a bunch of lagoons and um, you know things that today we would just not view as environmentally friendly or sustainable in any way. Um, but, but what he really did was change the face of Hilton Head Island forever by opening it up to private, high-end residential development. By 1975, there were three private residential communities on the island, um, and the town had its own marina, as well as um, an airport. And so we're starting to see development really, really take off. The island at that point in the 1970s had about 6,500 um, full-time residents and about a quarter million visitors each and every year. And so as a result, what we're starting to see is two Hilton Head Islands emerge. We have these private residential developments and we have the multi-generational Gullah communities that have been in existence since immediately after the Civil War. And those two things are very, very separate by the end of the 1970s and early 1980s. And this quote, I think, from um, one of the Gullah community members is really powerful. Progress is good, but if you can't live here, it's not progress, right? The island used to be accessible for everyone, and by the 1980s, it just wasn't. You weren't able to, to visit the parts of the island that you used to be able to visit. In 1982, um, the, the Swingspan Bridge was replaced with the four-lane four bridge um, that has now been deemed structurally deficient. This further exacerbated development. It further took um, pushed Native Islanders off of their land. Um, and we're, we're in the same boat that we've always been. Now there are only about 10 um, multi-generational Gullah communities on the island, and one of those is Stony at the very base of US 278 Bridge. And this is what that roadway looks like on a typical rush hour morning. There are brothers that own property, one on this side, one on that side. They literally cannot go, they cannot walk to see one another, even though they live about 200 yards from one another because they have to get in their car. It's not safe for them to cross this roadway. There's no stoplights, there's no bike lanes, there's no, there's no sidewalks here, right? Um, it's just not a safe roadway. And if you talk to the members of the community, what they will tell you is that it's fairly often that they end up with wrecked vehicles in their road because there's traffic accidents right here. And this is the sentiment amongst the members of Stony. This roadway is killing our heritage. It used to be a dirt road. Um, you know, we used to farm here. We used to have horses. And now we can't even go see our relatives because of this road. Now elsewhere on Hilton Head Island, in the private residential end of the island on the south, this is what US 278 looks like. Which one would you ever rather walk on, right? Um, there's street trees, there's a, a landscaped median, you can see over here, this is a designated recreational path, it's for bikes and walkers, um, and there's slower speed limits. People aren't traveling this roadway at 60 miles per hour, they're traveling at 30 miles per hour, if that. So why? Why does the um, northern end of US 278 look like the one in the upper left hand corner, and the southern end looks like that? Well, here's one of my favorite, favorite reasons why, okay? So this is a screenshot that I grabbed from a county council meeting where um, a traffic light improvement was on the agenda. Traffic light improvement that would have impacted one of those private residential communities. It's along US 278, but it's a minor, minor street improvement. This is just half of the room. The other half of the room is also packed with people that look just like that, right? <laughs> I am standing in the hallway because I don't even have a seat in this room. It's so jam-packed. Every single one of these people stood up during public comment and supported the installation of a traffic light. This is 
what a town council meeting on Hilton Head Island looks like when the US 278 widening project is on the agenda. These people are not here to talk about US 278 widening. Do you know what this guy's talking about? Pickleball, okay? <laughs> he is talking about the town's lackluster maintenance of its recreational facilities. So why? Why is the Gullah community not engaged in this conversation? Because this meeting is in B the city of Beaufort, which is an hour and a half outside of Hilton Head, and it starts at 6 o'clock. So you have to leave your house to get to this meeting at 4.30. Well, what do you notice about all these people? They're old, okay? <laughs> They've got nothing better to do. They're retired. They live in these private gated communities because they're retired and they want to play golf, okay? <laughs> so they can come to this meeting. This meeting's even worse. It starts at 4. The residents in Stoney are working members of the public. They don't get off work before 5, and so they can't come to this meeting. They can't participate in this discussion. And I have tried my hardest to get county council and the town council to start their meetings later, but it ain't going to happen. So we've got to do something different. Okay, why else isn't the Gullah community involved? Because it's complicated, right? I mean, I told you there's been town plans, there's been county plans, state DOT has a plan, we're going through the NEPA process. What is NEPA, okay? What about the Federal Highway Administration? How do they play into this conversation? And so people, including myself, if it wasn't my job to keep up with this, just kind of throw up their hands and say, well, I don't even know where we are. It seems like a done deal to me. And, of course, as we discussed previously, the town, developers, and the Department of Transportation haven't exactly given these folks a reason to think that they're not going to be taken advantage of. So the result is, when SCDOT hosted their first public input meeting, there were hundreds and hundreds of people at this meeting, but I saw six members of the Stony community there. Um, and so I talked to the two brothers that I know that live in that community, and I said, how can we help? What can we do? Um, what do, does the community need to feel engaged in this process? Because it's not a done deal. We can change how this process looks. We can change what this roadway looks like. We just have to get involved. And they offered to help me organize uh, uh, our own public informational meeting where we described the process and how they could get involved. And because we talked to the people who actually lived there, we had 80 people at our community meeting. And we were able to tell them what levers they needed to push to exert some pressure on the South Carolina Department of Transportation. We knew that they were about to um, start the NEPA process, which is the National Environmental Policy Act, and they have to prepare what's called an environmental assessment. And an environmental assessment um, makes sure that you're complying with all sorts of federal regulations, but it also really just assesses what the environmental impact of the project is going to be and what the community impact on the, of the project is going to be. And part of that is accepting public comment. So we hosted a second public informational session where we talked to people about their memories of the community, what it was like, what they wanted to see in the future, and helped them write those down. Helped them submit their comments online, or if they weren't comfortable using the computer, we helped them write them out, and we made sure they got mailed to the South Carolina Department of Transportation. And what's really cool is at both of these meetings, we invited town representatives to show up, and they did. The mayor showed up, members of town staff, and they just stayed quiet and listened. And the result of them being a part of this process is that they have now formed their own US 278 Gateway Corridor Committee to exert pressure on the South Carolina Department of Transportation. They have appointed several members of the Stony community to serve on this task force, as well as um, other small business owners in the area and things like that. Um, and this now we have this huge coalition, right, that's pushing SCDOT to do the right thing, to do, design the road in the right way, to incorporate things like mass transportation, bike and pedestrian lanes that are going to solve that capacity issue and not involve widening the roadway and taking um, Native Islander land away from them. We've also reached out to um, state 
um, representatives and senators who are on board with us. We've reached out to um, our U.S. representative who's staying engaged in this process. And so we're really all kind of marching towards the same final goal, which is really exciting. And the last thing I want to touch on with this project um, and something that I think really so separates the South Carolina Coastal Conservation League from other environmental organizations is yes, at the onset, our goal is to work with the agency, it's to work with the town, it's to work with community members to make sure that this project looks the right way and functions the right way. But at the end of the day, if it doesn't, we are willing to fight it with what we call the last tool in the toolbox, right? Litigation, okay? I don't think we're gonna be there with this project because we, have, we are doing all the right things and DOT has exhibited some signs that they wanna do it the right way too. Um, but we're willing to fight this fight um, to the very end if it's absolutely necessary. But what's cool about this project to me is that the, the tenor of the conversation has changed from one of frustration and a lack of hope to one of, yes, we can be involved in this process and we can change its outcome. This project is ongoing. It won't be finished for 5, 10, I don't know, 20 years. Um, but we've started it off on the right foot, and that's really exciting. So with that, I want to um, change gears and talk about another project that is kind of finished, and it's a nice example of how we um, start a project and are kind of opportunistic, and to the end where we see the results of our policy. And that is our work to combat plastic pollution. Um, so you all may know some of this. It's uh, pretty... Pretty, pretty well out there in the public now, um, but we are reliant on single-use plastic products from single-use plastic bags, which are completely ubiquitous in our society. We go through trillions of them in the United States um, to single-use water bottles, which we just like use and throw away, or maybe if we're lucky, we recycle a couple of them. But we are dumping 22,747 jumbo jets worth of plastic into our oceans each and every year. That is not sustainable. Plastic fibers are being found in all of our tap water. We just did a study at the South Carolina State House. It's in the water fountains, okay? They're in water bottles. It's showing up in our food sources. It's just completely prevalent. And in fact, by 2050, a recent study said that there will be more plastic in the water than there, is, than there are fish. Um, and if we don't slow down these trends, plastic in the ocean is scheduled to triple in the next decade. Locally in South Carolina, the Citadel did a recent study that found that there are tons of plastic floating around in the Charleston Harbor. And I think this really hit home with our local elected officials that this stuff was getting into our waterways. Well, okay, Ricky, it's getting in our water. Who cares? Like, I know it's there, but what's the harm? Well, it's really killing our wildlife. Let's start there. Um, you know, the South Carolina Aquarium has shown this huge uptick over the past five years in sea turtles that are being admitted to their hospitals from plastic ingestion. Sea turtles really have a favorite snack. It's jellyfish. And so if they see a single-use plastic bag floating in the water, next, it looks almost exactly like a jellyfish, especially in South Carolina's murky waters. Um, and once they take a bite of it, they can't spit it back out. They have to swallow it. They have these backward-facing spines in their throat that don't allow them to regurgitate that plastic material. And once it enters their digestive system, it can really wreak havoc. It can suffocate them. Um, it can cause gas to build up in their stomach, which causes them to float to the surface. And from there, um, they're really helpless against predators like sharks. It's also breaking down into microplastics. Microplastics are little tiny toxic sponges, basically. All that good pollution that we dumped into the water for years and years, PCBs, DDT, oil, you know, it's all getting absorbed by these plastic particles, which then are ingested by smaller sea creatures, larger sea creatures, eventually us. And once those toxic substances make their way into our body, they start to leach out. And the research is really only emerging. There's new stuff on it every day on what the health impacts of ingesting microplastic really are. Um, but a recent study out of the Pacific Northwest found that oysters that have ingested microplastics have, um, have their reproductive rates cut in half. So this stands to 
um, really impact our fishery industry, fishery industries as well as our human health. So Beaufort County elected officials were kind of keeping up on this. They were learning about the impacts of plastic on our environment and on our human health and on um, the wildlife that we really love in South Carolina. And they started to think about what they could do to help combat this problem. And so they started to think, well, what about a ban on some of these single-use plastic products? And they asked us to provide them some data on where these bans were in effect, how effective they were, um, and, and what that would look like. And so we started working with Beaufort County Council and we found that there are 20 million Americans living in jurisdictions where there are bans on some sort of single-use plastic product, whether that's plastic bags, um, styrofoam cups, styrofoam containers, that sort of thing. And there are actually a couple, there were a couple in South Carolina as well, little tiny communities, Isle of Palms and Folly Beach that implemented bans on single-use plastic bags. And they were working. Anecdotal data. We didn't have anything firm because these are tiny communities and it's just a few stores here and there um, that are affected by it, but they seem to be working. And so we provided Beaufort County with some draft ordinance text that we had gathered from other jurisdictions across the states um, and across South Carolina. And they decided, okay, well, I'm into this idea. I'm willing to learn more, but you know, I want to make sure the public's behind me because I need some political cover. So they hosted 13 public input meetings and they heard from hundreds of citizens and all but a handful supported banning single-use plastic bags. The people who didn't support it, well, about three of those were paid lobbyists from the plastic industry. <laughs> so um, they really felt like that was something that they wanted to do. But Beaufort County has four municipalities within it. The city of Beaufort, town of Port Royal, Bluffton, and Hilton Head Island. And what the county didn't want to do is pass an ordinance and, you know, find out that yeah, I can't get a bag over here, but if I go across the street, I can get a single-use plastic bag. And so they included this provision in their ordinance that I thought was really wise, which was that this ordinance would only take effect at the date that the last municipality passed their own ban on single-use plastic bags. And so what happened is that all of the municipalities got on board and passed this ban on single-use plastic bags on the exact same date. And so the, all the bag bans um, went into effect on November 1st of 2018, and the initial data is really promising. Um, we've seen a 90% reduction in the number of single-use plastic bags that are being found on the beach. So it's really exciting. And it's um, unfortunately being fought by plastic lobbyists in, in, um, at the State House. They have proposed this bill called a ban on bans bill that would basically undo all of that work that Beaufort County and now 14 other municipalities have done. By 2020, there will be half a million people in South Carolina living in jurisdictions where there's a ban on single-use plastic bags or other single-use plastic products. Um, and they want to undo this. It, there's no grandfather clause. Our ordinance would be completely wiped out. Um, and it's just another example of why you have to work at the local level, the state level, and the federal level because um, you know, it's just, it's just a constant battle, and that's the, the truth of environmental work, it's the truth of conservation work, is um, the fight's never over, you just have to keep, keep fighting. But, back to a positive note, um, what Beaufort County has done since passing the ban on single-use plastic bags is that they have also um, hired three new litter control officers whose full-time job is to pick up plastics and other waste. Um, they have also started educating businesses through their Chamber of Commerce on the negative impacts of plastic pollution. And we've seen local businesses voluntarily make the switch to paper products or compostable products, which is really exciting because a little bit of education can go a very long way. So um, it's just exciting to see something that was just a small idea become a policy become an ordinance, and then start to see um, the results of, uh, and the fruits of that labor. And that's what I find really exciting about environmental advocacy work, is seeing how it changes people's mindsets, unlike that case that I had against DuPont, right? 
if we'd won that case, do you think DuPont would have behaved any differently in the future? Maybe, maybe not. But with a ban on single-use plastic bags, we're causing a real difference on the ground. Um, and with getting a community engaged in a transportation project, we're getting people who care about these issues and are going to make a difference going forward. And so with that, I'm just going to go ahead and close. Um, and thank you all so much for having me. And I will be happy to answer any questions y'all might have.